Today I'm meeting with Sir Anthony Hopkins at the Langham Hilton Hotel in London. Now come with me as we talk to him at the Royal Suite and learn about his life. Well, I'm delighted to have you here, Sir Anthony. I guess you want me to call you Tony, is that right? Tony is more We talked about that. Think, yes. Right. People have, they're so in awe of all of the things that you've achieved. Okay. And what I would like to find out is how did it all begin? Well, my life has been a total mystery to me because I started, I was born in South Wales in a town called Port Talbot. It was a small industrial town. I was born in 1937, the end of 37, December the 31st, 1937. And uh, I have very, very clear sunlit memories of my childhood. I was, uh, it was an old childhood really, I was the only, the only child. My mother and father, Dick and Muriel Hopkins, my father was a baker. And uh, I was brought up in a, I was raised in a, a, a part outside of Port Talbot, a place called Margam, which was then in very rural in the country, not far from the main town of Port Talbot. And the beautiful woods and moorlands down to the sea. And it was idyllic, it was my sense of Eden, it was my, when I was in school, I heard about the Garden of Eden in my Bible classes and I thought of my front garden, this little small front garden and the poplar trees and the woods and bluebells in spring and I thought it was paradise. However, it wasn't all happiness because my school career was pretty hopeless. I was uh, very slow. I was, I was, as they say in England, uh, as thick as two short planks. I was very, very, <laughs> very, very slow, very dim. Not very bright. I don't know what I was. Maybe, maybe I was dyslexic. Maybe that's what I was. Because my, I remember my first day in school in 1942. I was four years of age. And um, I was convinced I was on the wrong planet. All the other children seemed to know what was going on in the world, and I didn't. And I always felt very lonely. I didn't have any friends. I always played on my own, never played with the other, other kids. Um, none of this I regret at all, but at the time it was a little uncomfortable, it was a bit painful. I felt very lonely and of course my parents were very worried for me. Uh, my father would come home from his day's work and he'd ask my mother, he said, where's uh, Anthony or Tony as they used to call me? He's at the top of the street playing on my own, always staring at my thumbs and <laughs> looking at my fingers. I didn't know what I was thinking about, but I did feel odd. Right. But I have no regrets because that oddness, that isolation then later developed in my adolescent years into a form of, uh, of anger and resentment and all that sort of thing and uh, the dark side of my life, mm -hmm. the negative side, the depression, um, fear. But in fact it was my motivating fuel because what happened in, when I was 17 years of age I, I, I didn't seem to have a future. My school career was hopeless. I, mean, I was just all over the place. I didn't know what they were talking about. And uh, my father suggested one day that I get out of the house and join the local YM. At least find some friends, he said. All I, my only talents were to play the piano, right, and I was okay. a very good mimic. Uh -huh. I could impersonate other people, especially schoolmasters, people in authority. And I was the school clown. But they didn't like that. <laughs> they didn't like that, never caught me. Really. Impersonating. I know. But it was my only bridge to sort of normal living right. with other kids, you know, was being the school clown. Or playing the fool all the time. Um, that's all I had, the only talent I had. And I could draw, I was a, so I, obviously I suppose I was artistic. I played the piano, uh, rather sad dirges on the piano, which I used to improvise. <laughs> anyway, my father suggested I, I le uh, get out of the house and do something with my life, you know, find, find some friends, join the YMCA, which I did. And by sheer fluke or luck or destiny, um, I joined this local little amateur acting group run by a man called Cyril Jenkins in Port Orbit. And I was from the same town as Richard Burton. And Richard Burton had made a tremendous sort of success of his life. Was he uh, a sort of an impact on you? It was a tremendous a impact, really, yeah. although I never really knew him. I didn't right. know him at all. I only met him once. Well, I went and asked him for his autograph um, when I was 15, uh, because he was home from Hollywood with his wife, Sybil, and we've since become very good friends. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was 15, I went and asked Richard for his autograph, knocked at the door hoping that he wasn't in, and his sister went in the door. And Richard was there. He said, what do you want? 
uh, he said, you want my autograph, do you sign? He signed my autograph. And I was so impressed by this extraordinary movie star. And he was on his way that afternoon, it was a Saturday afternoon, and he was on his way to the football, the rugby match in Cardiff, the big international match. And as I was walking down the hill, he and Sybil and his brother-in-law were going down the hill in their Jaguar. And I remember standing on the little bridge, going back to Dybark and thinking, thinking to myself, I've got to get out of this life of mine. I've got to get out of this environment of my own mind. And you were only 15 at that time. 15. I was so angry and so confused it's amazing. and lonely. And I thought, I've got to do something with right. my life. I've got to do something because I've got no future at all. And looking back, I'm amazed that things have happened in my life. It's like, my, it really is. My life is none of my business. Uh, extraordinary things have happened in my life beyond my greatest dreams. I mean, I don't understand any of it. I can't take credit for any of it. I, do, I don't know what it's about, really. I don't know what on earth happened. Um, uh, I joined this little acting group, and then I got a scholarship to the Cardiff College of Music and mm -hmm. Drama. Again, by accident, I suppose. Maybe I had a bit of talent. I'd never really read Shakespeare. I'd never read anything, really. And I, then, I, then there was a lot of delay. I went into the military service, mm -hmm. national service, it was called then. 1958 to 60. Then came out of that, finished the, with the Army, uh, National Service, and made a decision to follow this career of mine. Did some work in regional rep, in uh, repertory companies in Manchester and Leicester and places like that. Then I had a spell at the Royal Academy mm -hmm. um, of Dramatic Art here in London. And then I began to form some idea of what was required for an actor. How did you feel when you discovered that this was something that you were really good at? I mean, it must have been amazing. Here you felt sort of, sort of down about yourself, and, you know. Well, I look back on the last 30 years of my life, and I still see myself as a lucky amateur who just mm -hmm. got away with it for 30 years. I have no real feeling of being an actor. I don't feel like an actor. Right. I feel like an outsider in the acting profession. All these are welcome feelings to me. They're not bad feelings. These are very positive feelings. Yes. I don't feel I belong to the acting profession at all. I don't have seek out friends in the acting business. I don't have any friends in the acting business. Well, I do one or two close friends, but um, I don't. I'm not involved in the society of actors. Mm. I like actors. I've got nothing against actors at all. Right. But I, I, I don't belong there. Um, I don't really feel that comfortable in ensemble companies. I don't feel. I still feel pretty dim. I'm not, this is in no way a self put down. No, this is really no. a, a very positive feeling I have about myself. Right. That it doesn't finally matter. It's no big deal. I, this is my living. It's given me a tremendous way of life. I don't know whether I'm good or bad, and I don't really care. Oh, I think you're excellent in the parts well, that I have seen you in. I mean, well, you well, take on the character, is what you do. It's not, you know, there, there are actors who you say, Oh, that's so and so. Yeah. It's they're always themselves. Yeah. But when you're in something, you take on the personality and the character. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe the I'm told that. Yes. And I do. feel when I do when I do that, I do actually become those characters. But it's no pain. It's no. Mm -hmm. I sort of back into the parts. I sort of it's like acting by Zen. I don't know what I, I. I simply learn the lines and show up. I get the script. I look at it. I read it a few times. And then I go over and over and over the part. And I put it into perspective and I just learn it. Yes. And by learning it, I somehow pick up impulses from the character which is inside me. I let the character play me in a way. But what has happened in some strange, circuitous way on this journey through life is that I've become more at peace with myself. I suppose we compensate for our lives, for our lacks, if we choose to because I felt so lacking as a child and in my adolescent years and early adult years, I, through anger, or resentment or drive or ambition or whatever, I found my way somehow. I don't actually believe I did it totally on my own. I believe in some power of life that is in us. I'm a fatalist. I believe in destiny. I believe that if we relax and let go enough and actually do believe that our lives are none of our business and open up, then extraordinary things begin to happen.